Thank you so much for joining us today. On behalf of Public Knowledge, I'd like to welcome you to 3D DC 2016. My name is Courtney Duffy, and I am the Arts and Technology Policy Fellow at Public Knowledge, a position which is co-sponsored by New York City-based Fractured Atlas, and which is made possible through the Robert W. Deutsch Foundation. I've had the opportunity to take over the reins of 3D DC this year, and I can tell you, although I am biased, that we have a truly engaging day in store, and we're really thrilled that you're with us. You may not know this, but 3DDC 2016 marks the event's fifth birthday. By a show of hands, is there anyone here who was in attendance for year one? Great, so we've got all new faces. I love that. Five years of bringing together members of the 3D printing community with DC policymakers right here on Capitol Hill. It remains the only event of its kind. To help mark that important milestone, we expanded the event this year to include a day of advocacy training and congressional visits for members of the 3D printing community. The advocates, colleagues of yours, honed their advocacy skills yesterday and did the 3D printing industry proud. Before introducing our panels, I'd like to take a moment to express our sincere gratitude to our, to our sponsors and the Congressional Maker Caucus, without whom this event would not take place. So if we could give them a round of applause. Before introducing our panels, I'd like to take a few moments uh, to get some housekeeping things underway. <coughs> Um, we've got a dynamic panel programming series lined up for today, which really illustrates the wide range of industries that 3, the 3D printing community touches. Our STEAM education panel will kick things off, followed by a panel on 3D printing and the environment, social impact, bridging the workforce skills gap, and the arts. We encourage you to engage in the conversation on social media using hashtag 3DDC 2016 and the uh, network and password to connect to Wi-Fi are here on the screen. Um, following the panels, which wind down at 3 o'clock, we have got an interactive 3D printing reception in the Rayburn cafeteria, which is right on this floor, just around the corner. So we've got catering, we've got drinks, and of course we've got 3D printing, and I don't know what else you could well, ask out of your Thursday night, so it'll be really great. <laughs> Uh, so without further ado, I will turn things over to my colleague, Chris Lewis, who is the VP of Government Affairs at Public Knowledge, and he will get things underway with our 3D printing and STEAM education panel. Enjoy. Morning. Thank you, Courtney. Let's let's have our first panel make their way up here as well. You guys know who you are. You got the names here, and we'll, we'll get started. Uh, this is uh, the second time we've been able to have a panel on uh, on STEAM and education and the three D printing industry. And it's a great topic because there's just tremendous uses going on in our schools and our libraries and our communities around education. Uh, and we've got a fantastic panel, some folks returning, uh, some new exciting panelists, so this should be a good conversation. Um, you should have uh, on, your, on your outline, your program for the day, uh, Twitter handles for everyone, so please feel free to keep the conversation going online. Um, I'm going to introduce our panelists, and they are going to uh, give us some some introductory remarks about education and STEAM education, uh, and then we'll have a conversation. So think of uh, whatever questions you, you'd be interested in talking about related to education and 3D printing uh, and maker spaces, and, and uh, after, uh, as we engage the conversation, I'll just call on you and you can identify yourself and we can keep the conversation going. Um, so our panel is up here, and so I will go from my right to left here. Uh, first, on the very end, we have Lawrence Slowick, who is uh, the design evangelist uh, for education at Shapeways, a 3D printing company. Uh, next to her, we have a brother and sister team uh, that we're really excited to have here, two, two of our uh, 3D printing students, uh, Becky and John Button, and they are very experienced uh, engineer and 3D printers. Uh, 
uh, at a very young age. We're excited to hear what they have to say. Uh, right next to me, we have uh, we have uh, Joseph Williams, who is Director of Instructional and Information Technology at Paris Union High School in California, uh, one of our returning panelists. And then next to him, uh, our other returning panelist on education is a Sophia Giorgio, who uh, is a CEO uh, and Chief Designer of a uh, of uh, the Morphe company. I, actually, I always get this wrong. Is Morphe the name of the company or is it the name of the app? Morphe's the name of the app. Morphe? Our, okay. our, our company is the inventory, but uh, we'll probably get to change it to Morphe full time. Everybody, right. everybody who Morphe knows education, Morphe, they know Morphe. Yeah, they know Morphe has a great education app uh, that works with the 3D printing space. So um, that's our panel, and I'm going to ask um, I'm going to ask Lauren to kick us off here on the end and and just talk a bit about how. Uh, broadly, we're seeing the landscape of 3D printing used in education and, and how that's uh, been changing over time. So Lauren, why don't you kick us off? Thank you so much, Chris. Hi, everyone. Uh, it's great to be here. And um, it's really, uh, I'm so excited to talk about this topic that sometimes I get a little overwhelmed. I even ask Chris, like, what points do we want to hit today? And I think the most important thing to realize right now is that this is a, a really a very early transitionary time for applying 3D printing in the education space. For one, uh, the thing that I've experienced the most through my work at Shapeways as the design evangelist for education is that I work with uh, teachers and students at all levels, from K-12 through to university and beyond, and uh, I've found that instructors and students are essentially learning along together right now. There is no, and yeah, I'm getting, <laughs> good. Uh, I'm getting, uh, so it's, it's kind of a, a communal learning experience, and I truly hope that, that we retain that spirit as the industry and as the applications for this technology solidify, because I think that is a, a major element of STEAM and STEM education, the fact that teachers go uh, transitioning from being the, the all-knowing, all-seeing all leader of the room to the assistant and the helper of the students pursuing their own interests and building their own projects by applying the stuff that the teacher helps them learn. And so I think the, the experience that everyone's having in the classroom right now around this technology is one that we should try to preserve with uh, the way we structure classes, the way we structure grading. Um, I'm a huge proponent of the, um, the open uh, portfolio application process in, in lieu of test scores and things like that. And so, um, you know, keeping that in mind throughout applying this in any field that you end up teaching is going to be a huge boon for students down the road. Um, it's not about buying the latest machine or, or getting the latest technology. In fact, I, I made a comment that seemed to resonate with people about technology classrooms in the 90s when I was in high school, um, and they would buy all these computers and spend a lot of money, and then two years later, they'd be idle or slow or out of date. And um, I'm a little biased because the company that I work for is a 3D printing service, but we take on the responsibility of running these complex machines and giving you access to 3D printing. So that's the other piece of the puzzle that I'd love for people to keep in mind, is like just get your hands on this stuff in any way possible with tablet devices, with a, with a mobile device, with laptops, um, and of course uh, with education discounts, most of the industry recognizes that this is important, but I think the, the, the other thing to overcome is this preciousness about printing. Printing that first model is only the first step in a very long process of developing new ideas, so don't be precious about that first print. Get it out of the machine and into your hand as soon as possible because the learnings that happen when you get those ideas into your hand are indescribable, truly. I cannot give people words or instructions that, that translate to what you experience when you get a piece that you've designed finally in your hand and feel it for the first time. So um, that is uh, my stance, access and a spirit of co-learning. So thanks for having me. Yeah, thanks for being here. Okay, uh, Becky, let's start with you and John, and I'd, I'd love for you guys to talk a bit about your experience uh, in the classroom, the programs you've been in, what you've actually been doing with 3D printing, and, and what you've been learning. I know you've got some examples here, so feel free to talk about this. <laughs> or whichever one of you wants to go first. Okay, uh, my name's Becky, and I'm a freshman at, in the Commonwealth Governor's School, and I've been a maker since fourth grade. Um, 
During fourth grade, I took a Saturday Fab Lab class at UVA, and that's where I saw my first 3D printer. Um, when I saw it, when I, 3D printing at first seemed very like unattainable, foreign, because at the time, 3D printers were still very expensive. Um, in seventh grade, I joined a first robotics team, and I knew I wanted more, so I got, I had, um, I had got involved with the Enable project. Hey, John, and um, and um, I, I made a remix of a Steve Woods uh, hand, which this is what it, this what it, this is what I made in seventh grade, and um, um, so I went to this makerspace, and I had no idea like where to get started. And, um, I, but I, I didn't know that they had a 3D printer in the makerspace. So I go over to the corner where all these people are sitting and just say, I want to get involved, right? And um, the person there, there was a person there that was ecstatic to get me like involved. It, so much so that he ended up giving me his Thingamatic 3D printer. Mm -hmm. And ever since that point, I have been obsessed. Um, and so now, during my middle school career, they always had um, an enshrined 3D printer in the school's library, enclosed in this glass enclosure. Like, nobody touched it. Like, nobody knew how to work it. It was just sitting there collecting dust. In eighth grade, I asked if I could um, run the printer, and they were like, yeah, sure, just, you know, um, we want to, like, enter something in this competition. And um, so I ended up printing the parts for them. And I'm glad to say that now, the school has six 3D printers, and I'm mentoring a group of eighth graders that all know how to run the 3D printers and maintain them and can 3D model. Woo! Yay. <laughs> so, hi, I'm John Button. I'm from Caroline County, Virginia. Uh, I go to Bowling Green Elementary. I'm in fifth grade. And so, these are some of the things we made, and we did not make these through school at all. <laughs> so, um, these right here are ice models. So, this is ice 1C, uh, sorry, uh, ice 1H. This is everyday ice so that you'd find in a snowflake, things like that. Um, this is ice, uh, this is ice 1C. This is what you find at the bottom of the glacier. It's really dense, <laughs> as you can see. This is ice 1, uh, this is ice 16. This is what you'd find what neon gas are introduced to when the ice is being formed. So it creates these little pentagonal cages around it. So it so when you take the neon gases out, you're left with an ice model. So these right here are math models that we that we printed for the Virginia Tech Math Department. And so we printed these so you can visualize what math actually looks like and feels like in your hand. So this right here is a gear we made for our FTC robot, and so we made so so we made this because so the gear so the metal gears that you can buy for FTC are really expensive. So we decided to make these plastic ones, and after a while of use, we figured out that ABS doesn't hold up very well on robots. <laughs> so yeah, we ended up switching back to metal gears after a while. And this right here is a 3D printed drone. So we used a 3D printed chassis right here, and we used carbon fiber tubing, so uh, for the wings. And see, so yeah, all of this right here is um, Zima X5 parts, which is a drone. And yeah. Very good. Thank you for sharing. All right. I don't know if the podium was blocking for some of you guys on this side, but. Uh, uh, I'm sure, John, you guys, you guys are hanging out all day, so you, maybe we can have those on display. Um, uh, Joe, you're our resident educator here uh, and have spent time in the classroom and now helping build curriculum. Why don't you give us your perspective on, on how you've uh, been working with students and 3D printing? So for this, I, I think I'm going to give you two things. I'm going to tell you a little bit about uh, Parish Union High School District and myself, but I'm also going to dovetail more of what the students just told you and kind of maybe backgrounded in some edu speak and policy speak on why it's important. So uh, uh, prior to my current position, I was a high school English teacher. So I'm extremely proud that this is STEAM education because I was a humanities major and there is a place for humanities majors in engineering. Trust me, there is. And what we're doing on our campuses is we're building maker spaces 
And not only maker spaces, uh, as far as a dedicated location for people to make, we want all our classrooms to have maker spaces, we want hacker spaces and tinker spaces. And, and we know that this is an important part of a constructivist model of education, an experiential model of education. Um, and it's important that myself as the director of instructional and infotech, that we provide the time, the space, and the resources for this to be successful. Because you can't just drop a 3D printer into a classroom and say, well, I've arrived. And, and I can tell you a little bit about what Becky was talking about, that enshrined uh, printer. Uh, I tell admin that the most expensive technology you can purchase is the one you don't use. So if you put all that money out and you don't use it, then that is the most expensive technology you can purchase. But if it's costly, or in some people's estimation it's costly, and the students use the hell out of it, then that is well worth it. Um, and, and specifically for the, uh, the, the projects that John worked on, um, as a teacher, a lot of times there's a habit to lecture, to do the didactic for people to read. Uh, and especially in math, students need a mental model uh, of what's going on for linear algebra and other things. They need a, a mental model to really conceptualize it. And with the models that he has there, they're able to fully actually touch it and have a tactile experience and see it in, in, in reality. And especially with the eye structures, um, they can read about it and they can, they can know something. And they could know how those eye structures uh, uh, behave. But what they have there now is uh, he's demonstrated uh, a deeper understanding of those uh, eye structures and also provided a mental model, uh, which is important. So why 3D printing is important isn't just the 3D printing. It is providing um, design thinking, solving problems, having grit, sticking to it, um, having real-world applications. And it's not just the end game of the 3D printing, it's the characteristics and attributes we can build in our students to be able to get to that final point which these two students um, have demonstrated. Great, thank you Joe. And Sophie, you, you know, you've been building tools and, and apps uh, for students to use. Tell us about your work. Hi everybody, thank you so much for being here today. Um, my name is Sophia, and my team and I create um, a 3D design application called Morphe. Um, it allows people of all ages and skill levels um, to design in 3D um, for touch. So you can use an iPad, Android's coming soon. Um, we also have a desktop version, um, which is available for um, Mac, uh, but we're also going to be uh, bringing a, a Windows version out soon. Um, but we're in a lot of schools now. Um, we didn't design it specifically for education. Um, I started uh, working on this more than five years ago. Uh, the iPad had just uh, come out, and um, I really wanted to design in touch. I was uh, designing in 2D, um, but I didn't know how to design in 3D. And so I really did start designing for myself this program, and then um, we developed it over time. Um, we're in 96 countries right now. Uh, downloaded. Uh, we have a lot of schools using it. We're in steam vehicles that are going out to different schools. Um, just in terms of education, one big trend I'm seeing, and I know Joe mentioned this, um, and also Lauren mentioned this, is people coming in from this aspect of the arts. So people who have no uh, background in technology um, coming in and feeling comfortable beginning to design in 3D and starting to experiment with their ideas. Um, and then we also have people who have no artistic background, who are strictly science and math, um, interested in science and math, but who are infusing design, um, you know, the bigger concept of design, not just artistic design, but just even a, a mindset. Um, and it's across subjects and across grade levels. We have kids as young as pre-K using the application, and then we have university students. We have, you know, we have designers, we have non-designers, we have people who are not in school using it, and self-directed learners through libraries um, and through makerspaces, which are this whole world of learning that's happening also outside the classroom. Um, and altogether, this whole ecosystem that's, um, that's been happening in the U.S. and beyond is really um, training people um, to think about um, how to experiment with their ideas and get into the practice of creating. Um, so, um, so that's been really exciting for us on the on the technology side. Great, wonderful. So, um, please feel free to raise your hand, ask questions. Uh, we do want to engage folks and hear what you want to hear about from our panelists. So, if you don't ask any, I have a few I can ask as well. But we have one right here. We'll just start. Please tell us who you are and where you're from. Okay. Hi, my name is Heidi Shepherd. I am working. I have two sort of jobs now: uh, the National Endowment for the Arts and this Manufacturing Extension Partnership, and the project I'm working on has to do with connecting industrial designers with many small, medium-sized manufacturers. 
my question to you is, in what ways is the design thinking process being integrated into the process of learning 3D printing? Right, because you can learn just sort of the nuts and bolts of it, but what about the design thinking process? Is that also being um, part of the education system? I, I can tell you, yes, it, it is, and not just uh, for teachers. Um, we put our classified staff in our uh, division in our district do design thinking, making type of activities. And why this is important is this. Um, we're a high school district. By the time we get the students, um, it seems that education has beaten out of them the natural curiosity, and they're just used to just sitting there, and they're not they're not used to taking their imagination to some ends. And there's some false starts when you start this because when you have a maker space, a hacker space, and a tinker space, um, in the beginning the students would just sit there and say, "Okay, well, just tell me what to do. Where's the recipe?" And the, and the teachers were the same way. And we realized early on that you know, we need to build their capacity to, to be able to go through some design thinking models. And so we would put them through some design thinking models instead of, and also <coughs> including uh, design thinking models that build empathy. Um, and what that did is it gave the teachers and the students the tools of thought to solve their problems. Because again, just making a jump from, I, I, you know, it's vogue to say the factory model where kids are in rows and columns, and we hate that anyway. But that's where they came from, and now we're throwing them into an ecosystem that is uh, foreign to them, and we needed to build up their capacity to use some thinking processes to solve problems, and not just for teachers and students, for everybody on our campus. Everybody on our campus are educators, and they all need to have that same uh, ability. Or Yes, of course. Um, so I, I also do uh, part-time uh, education uh, teaching at Parsons School of Design. So we're actually in the process of integrating design thinking into almost every major at the new, new school university. And I think that is because the complex problems that we are set to solve in the next 50 years require that people um, go outside of their areas of expertise. So it's, it's very much recognized in the education space, at least in the post-secondary. I, when I give lectures to introductory 3D printing, I always bring up the design thinking uh, cycle, the iterative cycle of starting with a concept, um, creating a prototype, testing that prototype, evaluating the results, and going back to the drawing board. It's built into learning how to translate a mathematically screen-based design into a physical object. You are not going to be able to anticipate uh, everything that happens when you translate from pixels to um, molecules, right? So it, it's sort of, you can't avoid it. And whether people recognize that design thinking is a, is a practice that they have to teach, they end up talking about it anyways. So I would say that it's almost more important to just help people recognize that it's, it's a step in a larger process and, and it's a circular narrative. I mean, I ask you guys, like, did all of your prints work the first time you came No! <laughs> yeah, so you guys, yeah, you know all about that. How many versions did you do? Um, this one isn't even perfect. This one's starting to come off the bed. I just, it was just so big. <laughs> yeah, this, this print hasn't finished either. I can't tell. <laughs> this is a lot of the problem. And, um, the art, the organ, or no, is this neon? The um, neon, the, this, this, these parts, um, they like, they could not print successfully. Like we had to, we had to make these parts thicker, and these aren't still more perfect. Right. So right there, design thinking <laughs> applied. <laughs> Oh, sorry, Sophia. Yeah. The, other, the other thing I was going to say is design thinking is very important, um, but there are many other modes of thinking too. And this whole, um, this technology allows people to experiment with many, many different tools and many, many different ways of thinking. And if we can um, help people learn to be more curious and experimental um, and cross disciplines, which I think is going to be not just essential for kids, it's essential for all of us. Um, so, including the teachers, maybe you've just, you know, been an art teacher, but now all of a sudden this printer is in your room and, you know, maybe you want to experiment with biology and, you know, create a, a bioprinter. You can do that. Um, so, I think that it's, um, it allows this experimentation in a way that's affordable. Thank you. Yes, sir. <coughs> yeah. Good morning. My name is Safi. My background is IT and telecommunication. I'm from Sri Lanka, West Africa. I was a teacher, I taught chemistry university for 16 years back in Africa. There are two different ecosystems. The question goes to Joe. Now, this is a new 
just like what John said, I'm very impressed by it. Let's say I'm a teacher to John. I always give B plus and A plus continuously. <laughs> <laughs> and now we have this science in engineering and mathematics. But most of the students are scared of mathematics. How are you going to move mathematics into the ecosystem of this? Because if the student have, yeah, as a teacher, I'm teaching, I have uh, three students in my class, student A, student B, student C. Student A, these are students that are extremely intelligent. Student B, I don't know. <laughs> student C, not that they're not intelligent, but because of their societal environment. Now, they want to be part of this, like what John said. They are poor in mathematics, because mathematics serves as a foundation for science in engineering of my step. So John, how are you going to do it? So, it is a truism, and probably not just our district, that uh, students struggle in areas of math. And, um, and, and especially, we're, we're a high school district that also has a middle school, so we do have 7th and 8th graders. And, uh, and, and those students also struggle with math. Uh, but I'm capitalized on your point uh, that they're highly interested in these maker spaces and hacker spaces and tinker spaces. They're highly interested in that. And you know what motivates them to get to those spaces? is that when they're in there and they realize that they do have some skill gaps in math, and when they're highly motivated in that environment, what do you think they do? They work to improve that skill gap in mathematics, and we provide them their opportunities not only in the makerspace. We're a district that's one-to-one -one with Chromebooks, um, and they aren't in carts. They take them home every day, including summer. Uh, pretty much they can get that device when they're a sophomore and walk off the stage with it where they're a senior, if the government would allow me to do that, but I'm not allowed to. Uh, so we do need to improve their skills in math, but uh, we, we, we aren't helping them by, by beating it into them. We're not helping them by putting them in rows and columns in a factory model classroom. In the maker spaces, in the hacker spaces, in the tinker spaces, we have seen students deliberately work to improve their mathematical skills with a level of autonomy that helped them progress. Um, and so we've captured them that way. We've captured their attentiveness that way. Yes, please. Just on the software side, um, <laughs> when kids and adults to open our app, it's all math. You know, you see a sphere, a sphere is math. Um, you know, they're, they're using it to calculate surface area, volume. And there are many, many ways that you can teach math through design and through um, a lot of these 3D modeling programs. And then, in turn, um, when they're printed, where they can actually hold them and then fully understand um, the concepts and apply them. So um, I think that there are many, many math applications. It's just a way of um, engaging the students that they retain it. And they do retain it a lot better when they're creating it. That's what we found. We have here, and then we'll come to you. Um, my name is Teresa Resson. I work with Tech Shop. Uh, we're the big major space in DCRM. Um, I, my question is in regards to professional development for teachers. Um, what, we're see, what we're seeing in different areas of the country is a learning gap within the instructors themselves. So this technology is fantastic and as a makerspace we try and welcome as many teachers and students as possible. But public versus private, North Carolina versus Virginia, Northern Virginia versus Southern Virginia, there are huge differences amongst these teachers. And as we try and give them access to 3D printers, um, the teachers themselves need to be able to use it and need to understand how to communicate that to the kids. I mean, that's how a 3D printer in a glass box happens. Um, so my question is not just what are you seeing in the work that you do as far as offering opportunities to teachers who are oftentimes coming out of their own pockets for professional development, um, but also what would you like to see uh, in assistance for these instructors who, you know, graduated from school themselves maybe 20 years ago, and so that wasn't um, available to them at the time, and now all of a sudden it's in their next school. Next step, we'll start with Lauren. Areas where I've seen success uh, applied is usually a, a, an environment of co-learning for teachers as well. I mean, obviously there are aspects to 
professional development that we need to create space for. So what I'd like to see is policymakers and uh, education reform embrace the idea of an open classroom, of a more fluid uh, structure for curriculum, and giving the teachers space to, uh, as I learned at some of the many technology companies I've worked for, it's okay to say that you don't know. But that is a starting point to go and find out along with your students. And I think we need to make that okay for teachers. Right now, like I said, it's this burden of being the all-knowing leader of the classroom. You can still be a leader, but you need to embrace the mindset that the students are in and recognize that you're learning together. So I think, I think the, what we can do for the teachers in that regard is make that a safe state to run your classroom in, as opposed to knowing the answer before the students even ask the question. Thank you. Um, I definitely agree with Lauren. When, when this happened that we um, started the 3D printing program at, after school at my school, um, we all became teachers. Like, we, we all um, were able to learn, learn together. And it, I think we, it was more beneficial to us all to not just have one person who knew it all, but everybody had a thorough working knowledge as opposed to just like, here's what it is. You have to figure it out. I can add, uh, go ahead, that uh, a lot of times in education, when we talk about professional development, it, what's sad is that some districts are talking about professional development like it's one thing and it's one type. And districts need to have a robust offerings of professional development for teachers, a continuum of offerings, including collaborative learning, including release time. Um, I can tell you a model that I would hope that eventually we would have is uh, a model that we just partnered up with uh, code.org for computer science at classrooms. And it's an awesome opportunity for that. Now, if we could translate into the same aspect of partnerships for, uh, for 3D printing, um, that would be a, an added resource. Uh, uh, we also have a, a lot of opportunities in my district because I know as an administrator, my job is to provide time, space, and resources for teachers to do their job. And a, and a high performing and a high achieving teacher if I provide them some level of autonomy on their professional development and then fund it um, and, and make it an opportunity for them, they'll go out and get it. Um, and so that's what we need to do to make sure that happens. Great. There was a question right here. In the movement from STEM to STEAM, I'm curious what are some projects or approaches in this space that you've seen uh, as most interesting in, in that would most interestingly converge the humanities and the engineering field. Uh, ideally, specifically for non-visual fields like literature or philosophy or sociology. And do you tell us who you are? Sure. Um, my name is Philip. Uh, my background is in cognitive sciences and uh, educational technologies, and I'm currently designing 3D printers and uh, 3D printing curricula. Wonderful. I'd like to take that on. I'm the English teacher. Right? <laughs> Our English teacher will, yes. So before we go into that, I, I often talk to teachers, what is the role of the English teacher in the STEM building? What is the role of the English teacher in the STEAM program? And uh, it, are we going to focus more on the nuances of Vail? Are we going to focus more on Chaucer? Or, or are we going to prepare kids for the realities of reading and writing that they're going to have in their uh, STEAM program? And I would tell you that we're going to balance that as, a, as an English teacher, I'm going to balance teaching them sort of the canon and, and letting them have a nuance to their understanding of literature and allegories, but I need to prepare them to read and write expository type of activities that they're, that this going to pay dividends either in their career or college. And so where, where do I see uh, STEAM uh, for the humanities? Um, a lot of times it's in a larger project. For instance, um, you know, if you're with a large team and if you're in industry and if you're into industry, Google or anybody, you're going to have engineers and you're going to have social media people and you're going to have people that are going to prep that 90 second elevator speech and we have people that are going to write the business plan and, there, and there's people as part of the team that are good with colors and aesthetics and there's people that are part of the team that are good with coding and, and all those other things. So I see it in a larger team type of project where some of those skills are right in the wheelhouse of the literature student or the art student or, you know, or the engineer or the programmer. And I, more of a project team-based structure is where I see it paying dividends. Just to add to that too, anytime I'm helping someone set up a new software or a new piece of hardware, 
uh, I always dread opening up the instructions because usually the first thing I can tell is, oh god, these instructions were written by the engineers. Uh, so there is a huge need for communication capabilities, whether it's visual or written, uh, in the technology field in order to convey some of the complexity that you're working with. And what a difference um, well-made instructions, well-made explanations, well-made demonstrations can make. Uh, it can make or break a, a, a three-hour classroom block where they spend the entire time trying to troubleshoot an extruder, or they've troubleshot the extruder in a few moments and are now shoot, uh, printing you know, some new projects. Uh, so, yeah. Sophia? Yeah, just quickly also that um, we have people who are using um, 3D design to tell stories. Um, uh, you don't have to just print. You could print. We have people printing out, for example, um, they'll take a Shakespeare play and turn it into a game and print out characters for that game. And that will be taking things, or we'll have someone do a diorama of, uh, you know, something from, you know, like maybe Van Gogh's, you know, a bedroom, you know, a scene from um, one of his, uh, one of his paintings. Or we can all, we also have seen um, people do a lot of uh, stop motion, um, which is not printing. It's using design, which is also part of this whole continuum of understanding how to visualize. Um, and that is needed in every field and in every profession. So um, if we can teach um, people to do that, then we're doing a great job. Just reassuring that the dioramas that I was doing 30 years ago are still <laughs> awesome. I'll show you. We have a, a dinosaur diorama that was done by, uh, by an elementary school student, which is extraordinary. Um, and uh, you, can, you can print it. Or you can you can make it a stop motion and have them move around and even add music. Okay. Um, we have a new question here. I'm going to go to him first. Please. So, question for all of you: uh, hackerspaces and makerspaces. What could we do to be more relevant directly to the educational community? Question. And you are uh, Matthew Hines, uh, director at large, Hack DC. Okay. Thank you. Um, Becky, you guys actually did some of your work. John, you did your work in, was it in a hackerspace? It wasn't in school, right? Uh, no. no, yeah. <laughs> I think just like being there, um, the, the coolest thing I've, I've met like crazy cool people at um, our makerspace, like just ha like having mentors there um, was like the, my, was the biggest part of me starting, like having the person there who give me, like, let me just use their 3D printer and keep it. Like, like um, I know that I can always get my questions answered if I ever go to a space. space. Um, and I, that's often, more often than not, I'm going, like, when I go to my makerspace, it's to get some questions answered because I have no idea how to do it. Thank you. Um, I, no, you first, then. Each of it, or John? Hey, John. Yeah, John, we can't speak that, that's okay. Yeah, sorry, guys. Go ahead, John. Everybody has an answer. Yeah, I'd have to agree with Becky, because every time when I go to my makerspace, and I just bring whatever I'm working on, I always, I always end up with a finished product at the end. I always, I always get help somehow. What's the name of your makerspace? Hack RBA. Hack RBA. Hack RBA. Um, but to like, answer your question, basically, our, make, our hacker space, they have um, an open hack night where just everybody brings their stuff and we just talk we, we talk about everything and usually it's it's a very interesting experience. Yeah, yeah uh, I, I've been helping the um, uh, Urban Assembly Maker Academy. It's a public uh, school in New York City develop their, their fab lab um, and it's going to be open I think for the fall of this year, which is really exciting. Um, but. You know, we're very focused on kitting it out with all the right tools for a, a model shop and that, and that. but um, I was really adamant um, and I had support from my colleagues at Parsons that the equally important to getting all of the right um, technology in there was building a community element, that soft element of, of people talking to each other, of sharing ideas, um, and we've been holding off launching the space because we're looking for someone to run it who can host that type of environment and be the sort of Willy Wonka of the Fab Lab and show people around and get them connected to the right people. Um, and I think that's important for the sustainability of any makerspace anywhere in the world. It's not just the machines, it's the people connecting to other people who have similar interests and want to help people learn. Yeah. 
So when I was speaking with the students over there, and they were talking, and especially talking with their mother also about when they were working on their projects in the beginning, um, what I kept hearing was it was the space that they were going to out of school. And, uh, and, and, and I'm glad that those spaces are there, but what we want to build on our campuses is we want, we want on our campuses it to be like a learning incubator. We want there to be locations on campus, not just hacker spaces and tinker spaces, but other locations. I want there to be robust digital tools and physical tools. I want there to just not be a, a, a coverage of Wi-Fi, I want saturation of Wi-Fi. And in the hacker spaces and the maker spaces, this is like a learning incubator where the students can, can come in and they can, and they can iterate and they can do all kinds of things and, 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 and your schools need to be part of the community. So as a learning incubator, this learning will spill out into the community to solve real world problems. And so, the, and, and it's for, on our campuses, it needs to be part of some of, the, some of the formal structure of what we do, but really making and hacking is more of an informal type of learning experience, so we need to provide formal and informal learning. And then as far as mentorship goes, if you haven't had a chance to look at the White House's making an education um, type of policy, uh, there's a, one of the pillars is having um, um, having a, a, a maker in residence or makers in residences, and these are like mentors. And they could, there could be a nuance to that also. You could have uh, people that come after school that have a specific acumen for art or engineering. And we need to build into, our, like I said, we want our, our, our maker spaces to be incubators that spill out into the community, but we want our community to come into our schools as maker in residences and be able to work with our students on stuff that they're passionate about. And so I'm happy that there are these maker spaces, but I want that on our campuses. That's where I want them. Please, yeah. Um, well, I wanted to uh, say that I came out of a hacker space, Hack Manhattan, which is on 14th Street in New York City. Um, I didn't know anything about 3D printing, although I knew how to design. Um, and um, that gave me a community of someone named Dave Reeves over there, uh, a great friend who um, taught me how to use the Ultimaker original printer. Um, which uh, I prototyped uh, a lot of uh, the models in our in our application that we were building at the time. Um, I'm also a member of uh, Fat Cat Fab Lab, which is also in Manhattan. Uh, but I but I've gone to many. I've been members of several now in different parts of the world, even because this is a global phenomenon. This, um, as uh, as Joe was saying, this sort of informal education, um, which uh, creates these environments. Now, for for teachers. I think, because um, I think that was your original question, how can, how can teachers participate in this environment? They, they already are in so many ways, but if there are ways that you could potentially host professional development out of these centers um, and make it uh, priced accordingly so that it's affordable to them. Um, uh, you, yesterday we spent time um, meeting with members of, um, of Congress and their, and their staff, um, and um, you know, some of them were surprised to hear about some of the maker spaces that are right here in DC. Um, you know, including yours. There's um, there's the Fab Lab in DC. There's Tech Shop. Uh, there there are many. And so I think getting the word out um, to the teacher communities and you know even through the libraries uh, we'll do a lot and hosting PD sessions and even just showing them how to operate the different machines. Like here's here's an intro to laser cutting. Here's an intro to 3D printing. Here's an intro to even you know some of the Adobe software, some of the some of the 2D software that they can eventually convert to 3D if they don't want to start with 3D, and then of course graduate to 3D or or, or start with 3D because the only way to learn all this stuff is by doing it yeah. and by by just sitting in front of it and you're going to make mistakes. Um, some people don't, but you 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 know you're bound to you're bound to spend time doing it, and um, it's really enjoyable too. The so learning. We could go on and on. I I hear we have. Time for one more question, and we have a new question here, back here. Hey there, Michael Stone. I'm a former Fab Lab director at a high school in Tennessee, and a current Einstein fellow here. Uh, this is awesome work that you guys are doing. Uh, I don't mean to be a downer. I'm a huge 3D printing and school supporter. I'm curious, how do we prevent 3D printing from becoming like having the same doldrums that interactive whiteboards have gone through, where it was an amazing tech, they have a lot of value to offer, but have oftentimes just become an expensive chalkboard. Right in the classroom, how do we make sure that 3D printing doesn't become the next expensive, you know, uh, inkjet printer? Uh, how do we prevent that that from happening? Is the smooth point? Good question. Broken record over here, but like creating that that community and that environment that supports it and makes it not um, 
an exclusive object that is precious and kept in a glass box, as we keep returning to, um, is, is a huge part of it. And it's, it's, it's difficult to monitor that because it's not on paper, it's not an object that you can purchase. It's, it's an act of the group at that institution making a point to prioritize spending time in the space and using it. On the flip side, the tech, the tech industry, and I count Shapeways as part of that, um, has a long way to go to make this technology more approachable. Um, we're using tools that were never intended for 3D printing. You're using animation software, engineering software, manufacturing software, but they never really incorporated some of the needs of these machines. So you're going to see, I'm, I'm hoping, because I'm, I'm, I'm talking to these folks on a daily basis, some vast improvement in the next few years on software. You know, Autodesk has made a, um, a commitment to making all of their software, I mean, industry standard, Fusion 360, AutoCAD, all that stuff free for students from kindergarten through, if you are still a grad student, and you have an EDU address, you can get it for free. So they understand the access point. Um, Shapeways, we have a student existing student discount, education grants for university students, and lots of small project work with people just to get people that access that hands-on feel so that it doesn't, it's not this foreign sort of new replacement for something they can do some other way. Um, but it, it's going to take a village for sure. <laughs> Else? I definitely agree with Lauren, like the whole open access democratization thing will definitely like, if if there are the people, it'll stay relevant. I, <laughs> yeah. Very good. And I, I can't help but mention, uh, Joe was talking, he touched on briefly the access not only to the technology, but to broadband and to, uh, which is near and dear to public knowledge's heart. Um, and you know, Congress talks about regularly here as a, as a focus in their tech policy. Sophia? Yeah, just quickly, I think that um, uh, as someone who's designing technology, it has to be dynamic. Um, uh, technology is evolving, as we are evolving. Um, and so I think that um, we have to be responsive to that. I think in terms of 3D printing, um, there is a lot, there are a lot of exciting things happening on the, on the software side, but um, even on the materials side, there, and there are so many different techniques where you can go from something that's plastic, make a mold out of it, turn it into something metal, or you know, using other, you know, all sorts of other materials. And I think that um, one of the things um, we need to do um, in the education world is to expose our, our teachers um, and even the administrators to all the different options and how they can experiment um, with them, uh, because um, that's. It's not just having a printer sitting there printing in plastic, which can be incredibly cool, but you know, even beyond that. And these printers should not be used as like photocopy machines, where um, you can do that, it's fun maybe for a little bit, but you know, after a while, if you're not designing anything or creating anything or adding anything to it, it will get boring. It'll be a, you know, a $2,000 copier. <laughs> Great. All right, uh, this is a great start to our day, and won't you uh, help me thank our panelists for coming out this morning?